seated. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Psalms, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This is the last uh, sermon in the series we're doing on Ecclesiastes, and then we're going to focus our attention on the road to the cross and to the empty tomb. They're just right around the corner, basically a little bit over a month from now. As you're turning to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, let's begin with a playing this game. It's called Let's Pretend. Let's pretend that your banker calls you on Friday of this coming week. Seems there's this anonymous donor who obviously loves you very much. And this donor has decided to deposit 86,400 pennies into your checking account every day, beginning Monday morning. Quick calculation, that's $864 a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. But then the banker adds one stipulation from the donor, and that's this. You've got to spend all that money that same day. There's no balance that can be carried over to the next day. Each evening, the bank will cancel whatever sum of money you do not use from that day. Well, you pick up your iPhone, you begin doing the numbers. Let me see, 864 times, that's $6,020 dollars a week times 52, 313,040 dollars a year given to you if you spend each day, that money each day. What you don't spend, you lose. Now, let's stop pretending. Let's get real. Guess what? Every morning, Someone who loves you, God, does deposit into your time bank 86,400 seconds of time, 1,440 minutes, 24 hours each day, and the same stipulation the banker gave you applies. The time that God deposits into your life each day, nothing is carried over to the next day. Every day. You have 86,400 seconds, 1,440 minutes, 24 hours to spend. You can spend that time each day, but you can only spend it once. Now, that's true for everybody. Young and old, rich and poor, married, unmarried, employed or not, in school, in the White House. We all have, every one of us. We have the same amount of time to spend. You know, the concept of time really is, is fascinating. We, we think about it a lot, and we use it in our conversation. It's woven into the very fabric of our conversations. What time does the meeting start? Uh, how much time will the meeting take? Really, I don't have time to go to that meeting. Then when you're in the, in the meeting a few minutes, well, it's time to go. A coach... Stands. He says, time out. Honey, what time is supper? You know, it's time we had a long talk. And the one I used to just dread hearing was when a teacher would say, pull out a clean sheet of paper, it's time for a quiz. This word time going to be used no less than 22 times in the first eight verses of Ecclesiastes 3. So let's read it together. Let us read. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down. And a time to build up. A time to weep. And a time to laugh. A time to, to mourn. And a time to dance. 
a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a, a time of, of war, or a time of, to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak. Time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, a time of peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in the man's heart, yet he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. I perceive there's nothing better than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people will fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Keep your Bibles open before you. This is God's word. The grass withers, flower fades. The word of our God endures forever. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your word. And we pray, God, now that you'll bless us as we work our way through this passage and give us a new appreciation of you, just what kind of God you are. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you remember where you were first time or, or when you first heard what we just read and heard together? I remember it was the eighth grade. There's a song playing on the radio. To everything, turn, turn, there's a season. My dad reached over, he, he turned the volume up a little bit. He goes, hmm. We see, you got to remember, my dad didn't like all that hippie music. But for some reason, turn, turn, turn sort of arrested his attention. I said, Dad, have you heard that song before? He said, no, not the music. Son, that's hippie music. I don't like hippie music. But I heard the lyrics when I was younger than you are. You know, the lyrics to turn, 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 except for the last tagline that reads, A time for peace, I swear it's not too late, is straight out of Ecclesiastes 3. And the music for... The song was written by a man named Pete Seeger, who also, well, he's an anti-war activist, folk singer. He wrote, If I Had a Hammer, We Shall Overcome, and Where Have All the Flowers Gone? The only song that became a number one hit was Turn, Turn, Turn. And in an interview, this is what Pete Seeger said about the song and about his view of God. He said, and I quote, after my father died, I was thumbing through his Bible, and there it was, Ecclesiastes 3. Now, I added the lyrics, I swear it's not too late, to add some anti-war flavor, but no, I don't believe in the God of the Bible. But I did think the lyrics were kind of cool, and they fit the message I wanted to get across, so I wrote the music. In other words... Pete Seeger did not live in light of verse 15, or verse, yes, verse 14, where it says, God has done these things so that people may fear him. He did not fear God at all, and that's the way it is with many people living in this fallen world. People don't fear God. You hardly hear the phrase, a God-fearing man or a God-fearing woman anymore. Now, in Ecclesiastes, I want you to realize that there's this rhythm going on. It's kind of like a metronome. It's going like click, click, click. There's a time for this and this and this and this. There's a pendulum of time, but the question is, who's in control of time? Who's swinging that pendulum of time? Is it God? Is it us? Is it both God and us? Well, think about this for a moment. How much control do you really have over time? We talk about time management, but can we control time? Short answer, no. Can we back time up? That's appealing. 
why we enjoy shows like Back to the Future. They're so popular. But we can't back time up. Can we stop time? No. Can we jump ahead in time? No. Can we slow time down? No. Can we speed it up? Well, on our DVR we can. We can speak through the commercials. Can we even add one hour to our day? Jesus says we can't. Can we add one hour to our lifespan? One minute, one second. You know, Jesus said that God has put so much gas in our tanks. And one day that tank is going to register empty. Now, you can improve the quality of your life through healthy eating and diet and exercise, but you cannot extend the quantity of your life, the duration of your life, because we're limited. But what I want you to understand, in this time in which we live, God is not limited. God is sovereign over time. If we consider the main message here of Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 15, it's this. God's sovereignty over time moves us to stand in awe of God. That's what we take away from Ecclesiastes 3. God's sovereignty over time moves us to stand in awe over God. Two considerations that I hope will move you to a place of awe when it comes to God and time. First of all, let's consider the beautiful poetry of verses 1 through 8. The beautiful poetry of verses 1 through 8. Notice it says, To everything there is a season and a time for every matter, that is, every purpose under heaven. The idea here is this. The times, the seasons, they're not random. The times, the seasons, they're appointed times, they're appointed seasons. As a matter of fact, time is the canvas upon which God is painting this beautiful masterpiece of every purpose. Time is a stage. God is the playwright. He's the director of every purpose played out on the stage of time. Notice in verse 2, the, the bookends of our existence. Uh, we decide neither. We did not decide when we'd be born. Uh, we did not decide or we do not decide what the date on our death certificate will be. No, not at all. That is by appointment only, birth and death. Veterans Day, 1963. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy pays his respects. He goes to Arlington Cemetery and he pays his respects to the veterans who passed away. He looks over the rolling hills, the monuments, and here's what JFK says. He says, this is so beautiful. I could stay here forever. Within two weeks, JFK returned in a flag-draped coffin and was buried in Arlington Cemetery. What was his favorite portion of the Bible? Ecclesiastes 3. Now, if you fast forward to the New Testament, I want you to realize Jesus was born at an appointed time. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. When in the fullness of time, when the fullness of time had come, God sent His Son to redeem us so we would be adopted children of God. At an appointed time, Jesus came to earth. And when did Jesus die? By His own admission. When His hour had come. Only when God had determined that Jesus would die, did he die. Not one second sooner or later. Now we know here in verse 2 that, you know, anyone who plants knows we're not free to plant and harvest just any time we want to. Uh, we can plant whenever we want to, but God's appointed time is to plant and harvest. And it's foolishness. To ignore God's timetable. Verse 3 introduces us to the polar opposites of human interaction within the boundaries of time. There is a time to kill. There is. In self-defense. Defending our home. Um, we kill when our country is in, being invaded by enemies hostile to us. But we're not free to kill whoever and whenever 
we want to. Not at all. There's a time to heal. The healing here refers to national healing after war. But we're reminded that all healing is from the great physician. And the medical community is God's servants. Notice in verse 5 that we, in time, we tear down in peace, we build up. Uh, you see that right now in the Ukraine. A time to look at verse 5, a time to cast away stones and gather stones together right now in the Ukraine. We see these horrific images on television of stones on the ground, buildings blown up, scattered by Russian bombs. In times of peace, Stones are gathered together, and buildings are built. Notice in verse 4, there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And in the list of God's appointed times before us, there, there's, there's laughing, dancing at, at weddings, at birthdays, weeping, mourning, sometimes mourning deeply, except at sickness because of pandemics at funerals. Yes, we prefer to laugh, but truth be known, we probably learn more from those times of crying than we do from those times of laughter. Verse 6, a time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away. There's a time that we acquire possessions, and there's a time that we downsize. Sometimes it's in retirement when we're moving. You may be thinking, now, me? Downsize? I don't need to downsize. Oh, yeah? Look in your closet. You know, verse 6, a time to cast away. Might be, might be a good time for some of our clothes to take a one-way trip down to Goodwill, don't you think? Verse 7 refers to when you tear your clothes in grief. When you mend your clothes, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, move on. Ah, and this right here, there's a time to keep silence and a time to speak. I want to ask you something. Don't, don't you wish sometimes that someone invisible could be dispatched to stand right beside you and say, Psst, you need to speak up. Other times when someone would tap you on the shoulder and say, shh, don't say it. I know you want to, but don't say it. Verse 8, weaves together the threads of love and hate, war and peace. We, we war against people that we at least intensely dislike. We pursue peace with people we love. Now, what I want you to realize is when you see all this beautiful poetry, verses 1 through 8, there's a theme here. And the theme is this. There is a God-appointed time for all things. God is the architect of all our times. God pens the poetry of our lifetime. Someone once defined time in this way, quote, it's a stretch of duration in which things happen. And friends, every stretch of duration, every mile marker in our lives remind us, reminds us that we are traveling on God's highway. So that's the beautiful poetry of verses 1 through 8. Now, second consideration, very quickly, is this. Let's consider the challenging prose of verses 9 through 15. 9 through 15. Notice, what gain, verses 9 and 10, what gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the busyness that God has given to the children of men to be busy with. Are you busy? Of course you are. We're busy because God gives us busyness to be busy with. But sometimes we feel like a hamster on a wheel. A lot of effort going in circles. But God blows some wind into our cells in verse 11. Look at this verse. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Wow. Isn't that a great verse? Like a master jeweler setting a diamond in a ring. In time, God makes everything beautiful. You may not see the beauty of the moment right now. 
Listen, if you could see your life from God's perspective, you would see the beauty. And then verse 11, probably the last part of verse 11, it's probably one of my favorite ver parts of the Bible. It says, also he has put eternity into man's heart. Think about that. God has planted the seeds of eternity in our hearts. We know there's a life after this life. It's in our DNA. That's why sometimes when we're living in this fallen world, we find ourselves aching for a world that is to come. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. It comes from Mere Christianity. Probably my favorite C.S. Lewis quote. It runs like this. He says, and I quote, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, I find within myself desires in which nothing in this world can satisfy. The only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Another world. Notice, he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. We're, you know, we're not like the animals. We study the past, we contemplate the future. In our minds, in our literature, in our songs, in our movies, we, we transcend the present. We reflect on the past. We project into the future. But one thing we cannot do, notice, cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. One thing we cannot do is this. From our limited perspective, we cannot see the big picture. Only God can. See, we cannot stand back far enough from everything to see the beginning and the end. Growing up, downtown Hattiesburg, the homecoming parade for the high school and the university, and the Christmas parades were special times. I used to stand there as a child and standing on ground level, I saw the floats and the bands passing by. But I could not see the beginning or the ending of the parade route until one day I was invited by someone who had an office in the Forest Hotel to go to the tallest building in Hattiesburg, it's the Forest Hotel, and to look at the parade. You know what I could see from the tallest place? I could see where the parade route began, I could see where it ended, and I could see everything between the beginning and the ending of that parade route. Friends, God stands at the top of eternity's mountain, and God sees it all. So what do we do? Notice, I perceive there's nothing better than for them to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Verse 13, let everyone eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil, for this is God's gift to men. What do we do? Friends, enjoy God's gifts as he gives them to us according to his time. You see, the times that God has set are in permanent ink, and we can't add anything to the past. We can't change the past. We cannot change the future. Yes, we make choices. Choices have consequences. But still, time is laid out the way it is. So we will stand in awe of God. Look at verse 15. That which already has been, that which is to be, already has been, God seeks, or, and God seeks that which has been driven away. While this, verse 14, that people may fear the Lord. In other words, once we understand and everything that happens in our lives, all the times of our lives, are in God's sovereign hands. Once we understand that, then we fear God. And what does that mean? It means we approach God with humility, with reverence, with awe, with gratitude, and with hope in our hearts. Now, when you think about it, when you boil it all down, and you put yourself into it, if there are no redemptive purposes in Christ Jesus, if there are none, 
these 86,400 seconds every day, every second of every day, apart from Christ, has no value to you. Please understand that apart from Christ, your time has no value at all. You've heard time is money? No, apart from Christ, it's bankrupt. But here's the good news. And this is to everyone here who is in Christ. Because in the fullness of time, Jesus, sent, Jesus was sent to us to redeem us, to adopt us into his forever family. Because of what Jesus has done for us, because what God has done in his grace for us through the life and death and resurrection and ascension and return of Jesus Christ, every second of every day has value. Every day, because of Jesus, is appropriately beautiful. He's made it that way. And then, wonder of all wonders. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. In the new heavens and new earth, we're going to see nothing but beauty. And we will forever find ourselves, in the words of the hymn writer, lost in wonder, love, and praise. What an incredible time we have to look forward to. Beloved, if you have not come to Christ in repentance and faith, let me urge you to do it today. Do it today. While there's still time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign over time. We thank you that you have made everything beautiful in its time. That you have planted the seeds of eternity in our hearts. That we seek to know what is beyond the confines of the time we live on this earth. And we know there is something beyond this earth. Something that will totally and completely fulfill us in a way that nothing ever can on this earth. Lord, we thank you for giving us this time on earth to enjoy the gifts that you've given us. And Lord, to receive the greatest gift of all, which is your Son, Jesus Christ, because your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, makes every day beautiful. Lord, we are in Christ. We are redeemed. We're adopted into your family because of Christ. What could be more beautiful than that? We live out our days as beautiful days because of Jesus. Lord, I do pray that if anyone has not come to Christ, that they would today. There's still time. We don't know how much time there is. So Lord, I pray that we would not only come to Christ, but that we would stay in Jesus Christ and enjoy what you've given us in time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us conclude this morning as we stand and sing the first and last stanza of our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home.
now receive the blessing, the good word, the benediction. May the God of all grace, who is over all times and seasons, bless you and sustain you. And may you, in humility, remember that all your time is a gift from God. Amen. Thank you.